tonight and I have the honor of introducing our very own Mary Ellen Borg. Uh, Mary, I looked at your um, extensive life and you <laughs> and you are a woman of many many talents and I do think I would be speaking a whole hour here if I would name all your accomplishments. Yes, so I really would like to say I like Mary Allen's uh, uh, topic of tonight. We're going to dive into visual arts and poetry and see how uh, that affects our spiritual growth. I think that is a wonderful topic for us ladies and afterwards there will be time for questions and answers. And uh, without further ado, Miss Mary Ellen Borg. Thank you. I congratulate you for coming out on this very rainy night. And this is a bit of an experiment tonight. Uh, I am new at PowerPoint, and I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> and the whole thing is improvised, so <laughs> hang in there. Um, the topic that I gave is visual arts and the spiritual life. And tonight I add, through the work of Michelangelo, Dostoevsky once said, beauty will save the world. This very enigmatic statement has many facets, really. Uh, it expresses an insight that beauty in art, poetry, and music communicates a reality beyond the ordinary. Uh, and it could also mean that beauty makes visible a truth that may be contained in very ordinary things, but which we may have missed for lack of attention uh, or what we otherwise call distraction uh, because we have never seen anything from a new angle. So visual arts can help us to see life and the spiritual life in a new way. So I have decided to take a look at uh, one great artist, Michelangelo, and his contribution to the visual arts and why it is that his work, which was done in the 16th century, still speaks to us. He created many, many works and uh, expressed the truths of the Catholic faith uh, in buildings, in statues, uh, in poetry. Uh, and he was intimately involved in the designing of St. Peter's Basilica that we know today. One way that the visual arts can help our spiritual life is to incline us toward contemplation and teach us to see things in a new way. To see deeply and with faith is really at the heart of our spiritual life. Artists communicate to us what they have seen with their enhanced capacity for observation. And I came across this very beautiful quote. In order to produce great art, Michelangelo had a deeper and more receptive vision, a more intense awareness, a sharper and more discerning understanding, a more patient openness for all things quiet and inconspicuous, an eye for things previously overlooked. Wow. That's, maybe I'll repeat it. It's just beautiful. It's actually from Joseph Pieper. Yeah. And you can always go back to him and repeat things many times. To see deeply and with faith Okay, and his quote is, a deeper and more receptive vision, a more intense awareness, a sharper and more discerning understanding, a more patient openness for all things quiet and inconspicuous, an eye for things previously overlooked. Looking carefully at Michelangelo and his art can teach us to see more deeply and be more aware of spiritual truth. Michelangelo Buonarroti was born in Florence in 1475, a time of intense artistic activity and experimentation with new mediums. Oh, 
that's pretty dark. I'll tell you, part of the problem is the paint <coughs> on the wall has a lot of green and blue in it. What we really need is a screen. <laughs> so I will talk this over with John tomorrow. Um, it was a time of intense artistic activity and experimentation with new mediums and new ideas of the human person. After a long life, he died in 1564 in Rome at the age of 89. He knew many popes during that turbulent time of the Renaissance and at the beginning of the Reformation period. He spent most of his life in Florence and Rome when he was not looking for marble in Carrara or meeting with the Pope in Bologna. Florence, under the Medici rule, was a thriving center of banking, art, and architecture. Artists like Verrocchio, uh, and there was a recent exhibit at the National Gallery of Art on Verrocchio, who was uh, 15th century. They were trying new techniques, uh, things like casting in bronze, and new tools, and new materials. Humanistic studies were flourishing with a new interest in Hebrew and Greek. Michelangelo was familiar uh, with all of these new currents of thought, and the Medici family recognized his talent when he was a very young man, and they had him working for them in Florence, and of course later on in Rome when uh, a few of them became popes. He influenced many young artists of his day and all who came after him. Leonardo, his admirer and rival, was older than he was by 25 years. And of course, Leonardo was a genius of scientific observation and invention, who, being a little less organized and a bit of a procrastinator, never finished many of his projects. Leonardo had no formal education, and he could not read Latin, which is amazing, like Michelangelo could. But Leonardo was a genius whose powers of observation were dazzling. And interestingly enough, he died in Amboise in France in 1519, having been invited by King Francis I to spend time there. And when he moved from Milan to France with his household, he traveled uh, on horseback over the Alps with an unfinished copy of the Mona Lisa in the saddlebags <laughs> on the back of the donkey. And when you think of it, if you were in Milan, the only way to get to the Loire Valley was over the Alps. There was no other way. Raphael of Urbino, another great artist, was younger, and his strength, of course, was painting. He came to Florence to learn from Michelangelo. And of course, he's famous for painting uh, the papal chambers of the new buildings that were being created. He died in 1520, Leonardo in 1519, Raphael in 1520 in Rome. Michelangelo lived another 40 years. That, that's just fascinating. Uh, both artists were very much influenced by Michelangelo's powerful drawing and uh, his ability to portray movement. And Michelangelo was influenced by Leonardo's exquisite detail and drawing. Now, remember this man. Uh, this slide is out of place. This is uh, Emperor Charles V, and I will mention him later. But I'm such a neophyte with the PowerPoint that I didn't want to try to move it to the proper place for fear that I would maybe change the whole program. <laughs> Michelangelo saw himself as a sculptor first, but he was a painter of frescoes, an artist, an architect, a designer of churches, libraries, and he helped to plan sections of the city of Rome, and he was also a poet. He was revered by other artists, even though they found him very difficult and aloof and very demanding. He was all in favor of the reform of the church at that time, having seen and worked for popes who often lived more like Renaissance princes than holy men. One of the chroniclers of Renaissance art, Giorgio Vasari, himself an artist, wrote about all of these artists. 
He wanted to chronicle what he perceived as an unprecedented historic flourishing of artistic ability, and he was right. It was an extraordinary moment in uh, history and artistic history. He gives us some insight into these artists whom he knew personally. Of the three, he considered Michelangelo to be a genius because of his mastery of three disciplines, painting, sculpture, and architecture. Unlike the congenial Leonardo and the charming Raphael, he was more aloof and moody, a diligent worker who didn't spare himself to create his works in marble, in fresco, and in painting. He knew Catholic spirituality, and he shared with Leonardo a Tuscan wit. He worked with intensity and would sometimes choose a few pupils who would help him with large works. He did not like to have a large contingent of artists working with him, and many of the great artists of that time did. They saw them as extending their work, but uh, Michelangelo liked to work more alone. At a time when the popes wanted to make Rome more attractive to pilgrims, they sought him out. The faithful were coming to Rome to visit the tombs of the early martyrs. And starting earlier in the 15th century under Pope Nicholas V, it was decided to rebuild St. Peter's instead of repairing the old church. Uh, and the walls of the old church were buckling and the first thought was, well, we'll just repair it, but then they decided, no, they needed a new church. So this created many opportunities for the extraordinary artistic talent that was available. But the process was very slow and often interrupted. And so St. Peter's was only completed in 1615. So another, really about 100 years. One of the earliest works of Michelangelo, the Pieta, was completed in 1504 in Rome after he had worked on the statue of David in Florence. He was in his 20s. His relationship with Pope Julius was trying, to say the least. The Pope was very demanding and was referred to as the terrible Pope. In Italian, it sounds wonderful, terribilità. <laughs> it kind of really gets the, the, the music of it. In 1965, the movie The Agony and the Ecstasy with Rex Harrison as Pope Julius and Charlton <coughs> Heston as Michelangelo gives a taste of how difficult the Pope was. Michelangelo often lost patience with his demands and for years suffered under an obligation to create a sumptuous tomb for Julius, one that was never completed. And that went on for probably 30 years and it was a real <coughs> thorn for, for Michelangelo. Uh, but it was Julius who wanted uh, Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Even though Michelangelo did not consider frescoes as his artistic strength, he, he thought of his strength was really in sculpture. But he figured out a form of scaffolding without ropes that would help him as he worked on the painting of the creation and the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And interestingly enough, this scaffolding was later used by Bermonte in his work on the Dome of St. Peter's. His biographers point out that there was a very creative atmosphere in Rome at this time, studying of Dante and St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, interest in the Bible and in translations of the Bible and Hebrew scholarship. So this intellectual ferment opened up new ideas about the nature of man, which very much influenced his thinking. Michelangelo's character was very melancholic and intense. He had, a, he had the proverbial artistic faults, but more so. He experimented with new forms of designing a Medici library in Florence, and he experimented with new ideas with his sculpture. He wanted to move beyond the old ideas and the old rules of approaching all of these areas. He believed that behind all sculpture is drawing. Everything started with drawing. And he thought the artist should be well informed and know the liberal arts and science. His motto for painting and architecture was, they raise our intellect to heaven. 
Lemon as yellow, nuestro intelecto. That's the extent of my Italian. <laughs> he was magnanimous in caring for his family, and he was tormented with financial worries, uh, including a father who stole from him, and brothers who were often in need of loans. His letters show that he felt put upon by his family, and he felt that they should be more responsible. And as I mentioned, he liked to work alone without interruption, and he often didn't even have time to eat. Under the next pope, Pope Leo, there are a lot of popes in this period. <laughs> uh, he, pope Leo X was 1513 to 1521. He was a Medici, and Michelangelo did a lot of work with him. He wanted to build a new Rome, which was at that time overrun with brigands. And it's interesting to note that Leo saw that some of the old ruins of Rome were used in the building of the new St. Peter's. I don't know how you would identify them today, but it's just an interesting point. He also is credited with starting the Sistine <coughs> Choir as he was a great patron of music. He admired Michelangelo, but he did not have warm feelings for him, and he found him very demanding. A friend told Michelangelo, you frighten everyone, even the popes. Under another Medici pope, uh, Clement VII, who was elected after Leo in 1523, plans for work on St. Peter's continued. And then in 1527, Rome was sacked by the emperor we saw in the earlier slide, <laughs> Emperor Charles V, uh, who was aided by many dissident Lutheran troops. And the result was the city of Rome was left very much destroyed. So of course, most of the artists left. And during this time, Michelangelo spent a lot of time in Florence. When the political tumult subsided, the Pope wanted Michelangelo to paint the resurrection on the Sistine Chapel wall. So Clement died. I don't expect you to keep all these straight. Clement died, and the next Pope, Paul III in 1534, asked him to paint the wall. Between the time he painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel for Julius and the project to paint the wall, the classical Renaissance had ended, and the Reformation was shaping new Christian groupings that had broken with the church. So you had Lutherans, Calvinists, <coughs> uh, Anglicans. Henry VIII broke with the church in uh, 1535, 1533, So this created a very different cultural and political scene. So instead of painting the resurrection, Michelangelo decided to present the Last Judgment, which he started in 1537. And he seemed to be thinking about how this period of dramatically changing history would be judged in the final reckoning. We're all grateful for his decision. The Council of Trent <clears throat> that clarified Catholic teaching had ended later in 1563, so that was much later, one year before Michelangelo died. And Vasari notes that a friend heard Michelangelo say that death did not make him sad, because if life were found agreeable, then so should death be as coming from the hands of the same master, which is very beautiful. A few of his works reveal an intense artist, always reaching for the limit of his gifts and never satisfied in achieving it. The Pieta, now in St. Peter's in Rome, shows the dead Christ resting on the lap of Mary, the sorrowful mother. Up until this time, devotional images of Mary were often small wooden images for private devotions, and they were uh, painted in a very flat style, not at all lifelike, and they featured marks of the passion in order to arouse devotion and a sense of one's own sinfulness. In Michelangelo's large statue, Mary seems younger than one would think for the mother of the 33-year-old Christ. 
And there are no signs of the passion on the body of Christ. <laughs> there is realism and grace in the body of Christ and the grieving mother. These two most important people in the history of salvation at this very difficult moment after Christ's death seem to radiate composure and calm. The physical bodies are beautifully and powerfully drawn and at the same time, there's an inner strength of spirit that seems to emanate from the composition. The Last Judgment, uh, which was painted on the whole wall of the Papal Chapel, was started in 1537 and was something that Michelangelo worked on with many, many interruptions. And there was even delay in starting because the proposal was that the work should be done in oil. The Pope ordered that the wall be prepared for oil, and this took a lot of effort. Michelangelo was furious. He wanted to work in fresco, which endures longer, even though the process is much more strenuous, and can only be done in day-long sprints before the material dries. After months, of preparing the wharf wall for oil, Michelangelo ordered that the wall be destroyed and prepared for fresco, which took another year to prepare. It required six coats of stucco, three of lime mixed with marble dust, and the final po uh, polished coat. And it's interesting that in 1999, uh, that wall and the picture was restored by uh, Pope John Paul II for the new millennium, and they realized that it held up very, very well. This was Michelangelo's most dramatic work, and it was not in panels on a ceiling, which had been really one large design. This one measured 1,978 square feet and called on all of his experience to execute. Since the chapel was intended for the Pope and his assistants, not as it is today, where you know you get a ticket and you, everybody can go in, this was supposed to be just for the Pope and his assistants, Michelangelo wanted the final judgment to send a message, especially to the Pope. The Reformation was in full swing and the reforming cardinals asked Pope Paul to try to find unity. Michelangelo got the idea for the revelation at the end of the world to register the hopes and fears of Pauline Rome, but also to break free of its limits of space and time. And in this scene, the angel is carrying the crown of thorns. Showing his mastery of design, he wished to demonstrate the relevance of the emotional and spiritual expressiveness of the body to the troubled nature and the uncertain destiny of mankind. One of his biographers said, his early decision to place the figure of Christ at the center of the main design with a multitude of figures spiraling around him like planets in the sun, around the sun, lent his elaborate design a cosmic significance. The result was a sheer mass of over 400 figures in movement, the rush of movement up and down. A universal anxiety twists each soul. And you can see the devil pulling the lost soul down. And I think that figure was placed so that that eye, you see one eye looking in the direction of the Pope, <laughs> the wall was unveiled in October 1541 and reflected the militant spirit of the Counter-Reformation. So it's interesting to think the ceiling was done earlier and it reflects kind of a, almost a joyous spirit of the Renaissance and this, this is something very different. Another interest of the popes in beautifying Rome was not only to rebuild St. Peter's, but to have Capitoline Hill, one of the seven hills of Rome, repaired and redesigned. It had been used as a goat pasture after Rome had been destroyed 
1527 by Emperor Charles. And there were many, many areas in need of repair. So Pope Paul asked Michelangelo to work on Capitoline Hill. He redesigned it as a civic center and opened up the space. And he, he did that with many other works. So it was under Pope Paul that Rome was really restored to, to grandeur. I came across a fascinating article about city planning of Rome during the Renaissance. Uh, and it shows the uniqueness of Rome because of the presence of the papal government. Rome is different from other Italian towns and capitals. It has two centers of gravity, the Vatican and the capital. And I'll, this, this needs to be much bigger. Um, and in, in Rome, the capital didn't play a same role comparable to other cities like Venice or Florence or Siena, where the center of government was kind of the center of town. I'll have to, I don't have a pointer, so in this picture, the Vatican is way up at the top there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Papal Palace is there. And the capital is over here. There's the river is running through the town. It's, it's over there, and you can hardly notice it. And this is a map from about 1550. Oh, thank you. Uh, but you can see even in this very indistinct picture what a small town it really was. And so the main, the main attraction was, was the Vatican. So you have two centers of gravity, but the capital was not that important. So the Vatican dominates the area. And uh, it's interesting, too, that influenced by an important treatise on architecture a century before by Leon Battista Alberti, the popes began to make changes to the Roman streets to not improve traffic, <laughs> but to improve the visibility of the churches so the pilgrims could come and see them and be, find them and you know, be edified. For example, it was Pope Nicholas's idea to connect the square in front of Castel San Angelo. And I did find it on here once. Um, and if you've been to Rome, you, you know what a great big structure that is. And, but connect that with St. Peter's Square by three straight wide modern streets, including the Via Conciliazione. In 1538, the Pope asked Michelangelo to improve the Capitoline area, which as I mentioned was in despair. So at the same time he was doing these, he was also working on the replanning of St. Peter's, and they were starting to build a new structure. But instead of putting new buildings next to old ones, you know, just, he, uh, went, for example, on Capitol Hill and redesigned the spaces and the piazzas to show off some of the new palaces that were being built. And this was true in the Piazza Navona and the Piazza di Spagna. So he reshaped two buildings on Capitoline Hill and added a third for symmetry. So he created a sense of uh, uh, an image of hierarchy and organized power. So. Uh, the effect of all this was to give a sense of grandeur to Rome. And interestingly enough, in his later years, Michelangelo worked on the design of St. Peter's Basilica without pay. Now, the role of art is to open us to new dimensions of our human experience. Beauty helps us to see things in a new light. Looking at art and architecture from different historical periods helps us to understand these, uh, these times in their own period, as well as conveying ideas that words can't capture. As Theodore Rebb, a historian, has said, painters, sculptors, and architects are able to give us clues and sometimes answers about the universe that they inhabit that are available nowhere else. That's quite an interesting thought. Um, and if you think about it, there is a lot of truth in it, but you may not have thought about it in that way before. In the absence of words, architects can point us in directions that we could not otherwise imagine. 
Objects can offer insight into a larger world, richer in some ways than those of words. Looking at Michelangelo's statues is a nonverbal experience. And it draws us in a very subtle way towards his vision. Uh, Dana Joya, uh, the poet who was formerly head of the National Endowment of the Arts, says something similar about the power of poetry, that it takes us beyond words. And yet you go through words, but you experience something or you capture a memory of an experience that's beyond words. He says, lyric poetry is both sacramental and metaphysical. It is not enough to show the surface of the world or the exterior of existence. It's also necessary to reveal, or at least suggest, what lies beyond the physical senses. The relation between the visible and the invisible is an inevitable theme for the poet. This was also true of Michelangelo as a sculptor. And he created marble images that draws to religious truths and therefore lift us closer to true wisdom. This is the aspect of art that takes us beyond the mundane and the pedestrian, and I have to say the political, if you live inside the Beltway. <laughs> and it reminds us and, and points to uh, the spiritual realities that underlie all of reality. And I think that's also true of music. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his Nobel Lecture of 1970, spoke about how beauty forms culture. And he said, it's merely given to the artist to sense more keenly than others the harmony of the world, the beauty and ugliness of man's role in it, and to vividly communicate this to mankind. And he went on to say, there's something magical about art, whether it be writing, portraits, sculpture. Not everything can be named. Some things draw us beyond words. Art can warm even a chilled and sunless soul to an exalted spiritual experience. Through art, we occasionally receive, indistinctly and briefly, revelations the like of which cannot be achieved by rational thought. It is like that small mirror of legend. You look into it, but instead of yourself, you glimpse for a moment the inaccessible, a realm forever beyond reach, and your soul begins to ache. And he is the one, Solzhenitsyn is the one who quoted Dostoevsky where we started, who said, beauty will save the world. And at the beginning, when Solzhenitsyn first heard this, he thought, you know, it was just a, a saying, a phrase. But later he realized that there was a great truth in this because a true work of art carries verification within itself. Works which have drawn on the truth and which have presented it to us in concentrated and vibrant form seize us, they attract us very powerfully. And no one ever, even centuries later, will step forth to deny them. Even when regimes, and of course he lived under communism, when regimes try to destroy or cut down the roots of beauty, they will spring up in surprising ways. And he certainly knew that and lived that. I think his powerful words express the reason for the staying power of Michelangelo's work. He's presenting us with religious truths in a very concentrated and vibrant form that draw us to a response of joy and uh, a response of faith and an appreciation of truth. The question raised by the last judgment and the reality of heaven and hell are still with us. Much of our present day culture is not concerned with these questions and is content to settle for technical and political achievements and actually for a very superficial understanding of life and truth. This is a snare and a delusion. We are not autonomous creatures who create ourselves, but we are beings who are lovingly created by a loving God. Michelangelo's work points to the creator through the work 
of refined artistic skill and leaves us wanting more. More beauty and more eternity. Thank you very much. I apologize for, you know, this, as I said, this is an experiment. We definitely need to get a white screen because then you could see much, the pictures much, much better. So I'll work on that. <laughs> Are there any questions? I wanted to say, Mary Ellen, um, I was actually taking some notes. I was being a really good student because uh, I thought it was much better than reading a Dan Brown book. Uh, and uh, uh, which can be exciting. But uh, I had the pleasure of being in Florence and Rome. Uh, Rome was built on seven hills, uh, if I remember correctly. And um, I, uh, I'm really amazed that well, what I take away from your presentation is not just hearing more about Michelangelo, Ferrecchio, um, Leonardo, Raphael, but um, what we are actually here for in our community and in our church is um, to to see to see deeply and to see with faith. And um, Michelangelo seemed a little bit like a I wouldn't say loner or lonely, but he liked working alone, and he did have a sense of power or a release in the expression in his art. And uh, for us, sometimes we need that form of expression. Um, and sometimes we need to listen better or talk to people that you can see are in trouble or having a, a difficult day. So um, I, can, I can feel that through your presentation. Uh, and I like the expression very much, to draw beyond words. So to draw beyond words. Uh, so the drawing, the art, the poetry, I thought that was very, very good. So anybody, anybody has another thought about uh, Mary Ellen's yes. presentation? You turn on a light. Oh, yes, I will. I will give the microphone. And uh, if somebody I else. Have a loud voice. Yeah, 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 but it's oh, good for the. I have a loud voice. No, 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 we'll do it anyway. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I was just. I was just sitting here listening to you and loving it and seeing the pictures, and I was blessed to be able to see all this art when I was only 17. Not that we all can do that, but I'm thinking of as as grandparents, and some are young enough here, I think I don't know, they only get walked away, but most of us are the grandparents and older children. So really, go to the museum. We have such gorgeous things here to expose. I mean, I remember seeing all, I remember seeing David, I remember seeing, I was, it really helped my faith. And so I'm saying I really think that we can enhance the culture of our children and our grandchildren by exposing them more and more to what you just talked about and what you showed us. Because it does elevate. I mean, we took some two granddaughters and they were just overwhelmed. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful thing to give to your kids. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to force this on anybody, but it really does touch the soul. Yeah. Mm. And, and the point I I started with was um, that it helps us to see better. And you know, the, the artist, whatever medium they're working in, a, as I quoted from Joseph Pieper, they have uh, these refined senses and they communicate that to us in whether it's a statue or a painting. And all of that helps us to be more attentive to the word of God and to the people around us. I mean, it, there's lots to see uh, on many, many levels. So that's where art can really, really It's a no brainer when you take your children years ago, I take them to the church that was just ornate and beautiful yeah. and gorgeous, and they're like, yeah, they're pretty sort of bothered. Then I get another church that's modern, it's nothing out of them. Yeah. 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 So it does uplift your attention. It, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Art yeah. is the greatest. Yeah. It took 14 years of this. <laughs> And he mentioned that it helped him to meditate, looking at these beautiful paintings. So that's just another aspect of what you're saying. What we see, what we're fortunate enough as to see when we're doing these things. You know, and that reminds me.
reminds me too of the Magnificat, you know, and they oh, yes, use the beautiful yeah. art, you know, yeah. both mm -hmm. on the cover and inside. In fact, the cover of this month's Magnificat is so touching. It's Cry Angelico, and it's just, it's just beautiful and very, very profound. You could really pray over it. Yeah. Well, I promise if I ever do something like this again, we will have a screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, well, yeah, but it, it's, there's some blue and green in the wall, so it just absorbs the color. And, uh, but I'll work on it. <laughs> well, we'll have you again then. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> but uh, everybody, if you want to stay a little longer, we have more food and some wine. And if you want to talk to Mary Ellen, I'm sure she will stay a little longer to talk about everything. Thanks, everyone. See you next month. <laughs> Thank you for organizing this. <laughs>